how does Inside Out visually represent its concepts? Before we begin, there will be some spoilers in this presentation. Best to go and see this wonderful movie first, or at least read up on what it's about. Pixar have long been exceptionally skilled at conveying story through visual language. And Inside Out is one of the most accomplished examples of their rich history. This is a movie that presents children, and more importantly, families, with an understanding of human thought processes and the way we react and interact that most films aimed solely at grown-ups would shy away from. To achieve this, Pixar needed to simplify complex mental processes and have the representational characters on screen act out dozens of micro-experiences. So for example, one of the simplest and most effective ways is the pressing of buttons on the console at headquarters. Every child can understand the cause and effect of button pushes. Our first toys are framed around, if you press this, this happens. However, it's not just the button push that affects Riley's reactions, or indeed everyone else we get to see inside the head of, but who pushes it. This gives the viewer an immediate context. It also characterizes, but that frequently seems to be a secondary remit. Inside Out is, first and foremost, a lesson in the inner workings of our own minds. Colour is targeted frequently to directly link you with the corresponding character and thus the emotions. At the point when Riley experiences mixed emotions, something kids and, let's face it, adults have a hard time dealing with, the little sphere is a clearly delineated blend of two colours we have now learned off by heart. The ramifications of the mass popularity of this movie are vast. Potentially, an entire generation could grow up understanding their inner motivations and instinctual reactions far better than any previous, simply because everything is so vividly, visually realised. Similarity is used to establish connection. Notably, Riley's version of anger is a small, moustache-free version of her own father's, and her sadness is a less developed, less in control version of her own mother's. Both of these are her parents' leading emotions, connoted by their being central in their respective emotional consoles. Now, we know that these five move around a lot, but the center spot is key. And if Riley is defined by anything, it is her joy. Hence, the abundance of yellow-orange throughout. Anyway, these are Riley's memories, and they're mostly happy, you'll notice, not to brag. <laughs> But the really important ones are over here. I don't want to get too technical, but these are called core memories. Each one came from a super important time in Riley's life. Uh, like when she first scored a goal. Oh, that was so amazing. So many little exchanges whiz by, it's hard to process them all in one sitting. But little gags like Riley's anger punching a hesitant fear aside to strike out against her father. Riley, I do not like this new attitude. Oh, I'll show you attitude, old no, man. No, 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 breathe. What is your problem? Just leave me alone. This is amusing to watch, but there's also an emotional process taking place. The fear isn't being overcome or understood, it's simply being barged past for a knee-jerk, hot-headed reaction. And one of my personal favourite moments was when two boxes of facts and opinions are knocked over and need to be sorted back into their respective containers. Trouble is, they look almost identical. And we'll be doing a show on that concept as it applies to film critiquing later. Wait, Joy, you could get lost in there. Think positive. Okay. I'm positive you will get lost in there. That's long-term memory. An endless warrant of corridors and shelves. I read about it in the manuals. The manuals? The manuals! You read the manuals! Yeah. So you know the way back to headquarters. I, I guess. Ooh. <laughs> you are my map. Let's go. Lead on, mind map. Show me where we're going. Okay, only... I'm too sad to walk. Just give me a few hours to... Oh! Which way? Left? Right. No, I mean, go left. I said left was right, like, correct. Okay. This actually feels kind of nice. Okay, here we go. We'll be back to headquarters before morning. We can do it. This'll be easy. This is working! 
Pixar have a long and impressive history of using the detail in their backdrops to set the tone for their worlds. Andy's room in Toy Story is full of small details that are used in two ways. Firstly, to convince us that we're in a small boy's bedroom, and secondly, to show that the room is the whole world for the characters within the movie. In Finding Nemo, the ocean feels both expansive and terrifying, and yet enclosed and safe, depending on the background details which fill in for us where we are and what's happening, before the dialogue even begins. For Inside Out, Pixar's artists faced a particular challenge, as they needed to create a visual representation of the interior of a human being. Most of their previous output has been set in environments which are relatively realistic, but how do you go about showing that something is happening inside a brain? Even if they had chosen realism, the human eye can't see a great deal happening when brain activity takes place, and the hallucinogenic imagery presented by brain scans wouldn't tell us much about the exterior effects of Riley's firing neurons and swirling neurochemicals. Instead, we are presented with a set of stylized backgrounds and visual images which communicate, sometimes on a very subtle level, the idea that we are inside a person. For example, the interlocking patterns of memory shelves represent the folds of the cerebral cortex. Headquarters is lined with railings that resemble the familiar image of magnified DNA strands. And the combination of colours in Riley's later memories show both the increasing complexity of our emotional feelings as we grow older, as well as the blend of neurochemicals, serotonin, dopamine and noradrenaline, that make up our internal responses. The very position of headquarters lines up with Riley's eyes. This reinforces the message that our self is situated in our brains. The characters could be anywhere in the body. After all, we do feel emotions elsewhere, but we identify most closely with our brains. This is the source of our control commands. It is also the sole site of four of our senses, and the main location of the fifth. And this may be why we feel so much discomfort when our bodies have automatic responses to things which bypass our brains. And personally, despite the sobering note that the film ends on, that things are only going to get more complicated and potentially more confusing for Riley as she gets older, I found it very reassuring to think that those internal elements that are there to keep me alive are, by now, pretty well practiced at working together. Where did you get those shoes? Those are shoes of doom! Oh. Scary, this is gonna be good! I love this part. She better take back those shoes. All right, what are we watching? Fear, I don't think you can handle this. It's a scary movie. Uh, thank you, Joy. But I'll have you know, I'm not scared of everything. Oh, my feet! They feel possessed! Take them off, Marsha! We are no longer Marsha. We are the shoes. No, no! Ah! Marsha, stop! Oh, OK, I have an idea. How about instead we watch a nature show? <gasps> A young deer grazing quietly in a meadow has no chance against the vicious jaws of a grizzly bear. So, Shoes of Doom? Absolutely. Of course, yes. So let's ask the class, what is your favourite example of a concept expressed visually in a movie? It could be something big like the scale of the battle between the Empire and the Rebels in Star Wars represented by the different sizes of spaceship at the beginning and how much of the screen they take up. It could be Audrey's dream of idealised 1950s domestic bliss in Little Shop of Horrors, defining an era when people retreated into that dream to shut out the more unpleasant side of the world. It could be Shyamalan's use of red to indicate strong emotion in The Sixth Sense, and green to indicate safety. There is a ton of this out there, so the next time you watch a movie, keep an eye out for what the director seems to want you to feel. We'll read out our favourite answers next week, and we will feel deeply positive emotions if you subscribe. Let's see what you guys had to say about which movie with epic scale and massive stakes had you gripped, and, and why. why. Okay, we're going to hone in this week, so rather than reading loads and loads, we're just going to read our favourite four, but in more detail. Ben Hayes cites His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. Brilliant example. The what's at stake is the multiverse. It's every world, all of them at stake. But because there's a lot of focus on the smaller aspects of it, and this is actually a recurring theme throughout a lot of these answers, the larger whole is fleshed out and we care more about what's going on because we care about the smaller. So again, it has that tiny focus even with the massive stakes. 
which is Lyra and Will, who are two children stuck in the middle of it, and various other support characters who are caught up with it as well. Dan Mayer talks about Independence Day and the fact that the high stakes aren't just held over the head of the characters as a, this is what's going to happen if you fail. You actually see an example of the destruction before they go all out for the, now you need to prevent this getting any worse. Yeah. Several people said Independence Day. It's a really good example, actually. In fact, I would posit that Independence Day is more like the book World War Z than the movie World War Z. Most critically, we see the aftermath, the impact has on the survivors. People crawling out of the wreckage, finding their homes destroyed, their loved ones lost or killed. We see all of this unfold in front of the characters we've come to like and see how it affects them. So again, large scale, small focus. Super the Billy Bob also talked about Independence Day, um, but uh, one movie with big stakes that he's invested in until the end is Avengers. Primarily Iron Man taking the nuke up to the Chitauri being the completion of his character arc. Mm. And Brendan Agnew says possibly the best example of huge but relatable stakes that he can think of is what Tolkien and Jackson accomplished with The Lord of the Rings. Uh, Sauron's threat to all of Middle-earth being rather nebulous. Darkness, no beauty. Darkness! <laughs> Um, I said that on the podcast, that all Sauron really seems to want to do is mess up what the, the elves have got. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there is one place, uh, specifically the Shire, that provides our tie to the world and specific characters that personify the place. Hmm. It seems one of the best ways to get, if you've got a massive conflict, is not just to focus on one or two people, but actually to sort of spread it around a bit. And we did various lengthy, super in-depth podcasts on The Lord of the Rings, which you can find on our podcast feed. It was Digital Gonzo 110, 11, and 12. Get yourself sat down, though. They're like five hours long each. We've got a lot to say about Much those movies. depth and back and forth. Yeah, but they're great. And that is all from us this week. Remember, we have a Patreon if you want to help support the making of these shows. Our special sponsors for this month are these lovely people. We will see you next week. And school's, school's out. out. Come, fly with me, Gachinha. <sighs> right, fiver if I get this right on the first time. As well as the blend of neurochemicals, serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline. <laughs> no, 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 I said a fiver if I get it right. I didn't say you could have a fiver if I got it wrong. <laughs> Someone carrying a trailer full of spanners to the exploding cat restaurant. Mm -hmm. Anger rising. Head on fire! No, because if I do that, I'll run out into the street and just scream at everybody. Shut the f- Triple them gum. We'll make you smile. Triple them gum.